The content of this interview is not a substitute for the clinical advice and care of your doctor. If you have a concern about your physical, emotional, or psychological health, please consult a medical practitioner. I'd like to talk a bit about anxiety. It's not a personal question. <laughs> Anxiousness. You've described it as not feeling equipped to deal with what's in front of you, to deal with the day. Now that has got to happen when you're not with you. Can you talk about, and for the audience, let them know a bit about conscious presence and the relationship between conscious presence and anxiety? Look, we are, um an energetic being. We are reading life constantly and we're understanding it at very, very deep levels. It's when we deny what we know, what we deny what, when we deny what we feel and sense that we become anxious. So well before it becomes what we would call a uh, temporal condition that we can isolate and seek counseling or psych uh, psychological assistance with, well before that, it is already a condition that, that occurs at the being level, at the beingness of our, of our humanness. Mm. And so we are not fostered, uh, developed, cultivated, educated to understand our beingness. And so that beingness cannot be stopped. And, and when we start to comprehend life, or sorry, when we... Uh, feel that there is another sense to life and we don't know how to bring that to the fore mm. to help us in our day-to-day -day interactive physical level um, relationships. We, there is a gap and, and that gap is the actual anxiousness that people, uh, every, almost everybody lives with. It's a low-grade anxiousness that everybody lives with. Mm. Th that's, that's a really pertinent point because there's something, what you're saying is that there's something that happens before you've got the condition called anxiety. And that is, what I sense it is, is that there's a feeling of, there's an expression that needs to be had. You, you sense something, you don't know how to s say it. So instead, you leave that gap and you go into the anxiousness. Is anxiousness a choice? Is it a distraction? from actually dealing with that initial feeling that you needed to express or needed to play out? It's not so much that it's a choice or, or a condition, it's the, it's the leftover of not, not having uh, the ability to communicate what it is that you have sensed. So two things occur, either you completely shut down what you have sensed because you're not able to communicate it because it hasn't been fostered for you to do, it hasn't no. been developed or you substitute it and diminish it and communicate it in a way that is much less than you have sensed it. Either way, you are going to be anxious about it. There's, a, there's an angst about not being able to communicate that which you know is true. Mm -hmm. And everybody lives, as I said, with this low-grade anxiousness or angst in their life. And some are, some are very honest and, and can say they're anxious and others are very dishonest in the sense that they uh, dull it down with food and, and drinks and distractions and uh, checking out routines. Or they might learn to manage it. They, you know, they might polish their, their delivery or they, they go into the, the practice, the rehearsal and, the, and so that they can kind of, but always there's this sense that you're getting by, that you're, that you're managing um, and that anxiousness is, is there. So if everybody is experiencing that low-grade anxiousness, we've created an environment that must be contra to developing the being to be who they are. And I see a lot that the delivery of power to be in our authority, to, to, to actually just say it how it is, is, is missing with, for a lot of people. We, we feel like we might ruffle someone's feathers or, you know, like it's going to put someone out or you might hurt someone's feelings. Can you speak a bit about, 
about that and about the kind of ill perceptions we have of of what it is to be truly powerful and truly expressive. Yeah, this takes us back to another interview that we've done, and that is the fact that if we want to address any condition, especially the human condition, we need to take 100 steps back. I mean, 200 steps back, 500 steps back. It's just symbolic of how far back we need to go to address any condition. Anything short of that 100 steps is going to leave us in a situation where we are still in the momentum of the misconception or the waywardness that has got us to the problem in the first place. So, um, you know, we haven't developed the being. We are developing human beings without the being. And we are developing how to be a human without the being. But we're called human beings. So we should be developing the being so that we can be right human beings. And we're only developing half the person, in other words, the human part, but not the being. So we've mm. got to develop the human being and the beingness that is the part of the being and not just the human part of the being that is not the human being in its whole. Because we're not just human. And I grew up with Groucho Marx, so that's a little <laughs> bit of fun there. <laughs> so, you know, you talk about human life and, and the human being, and I get the sense that there's a sense of function in being human that, w w that we brought to being human. But when you say that there's a beingness, what are we actually talking about? Because it's bigger than being human. Look, the human being can be fixed. You, you, you get a cut, you get stitches or a band-aid, you have appendicitis, it explodes, you get it cut out, your heart doesn't hopefully work. Hopefully before it explodes. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Um, you know, your heart doesn't do well, you can get a heart transplant, you can get some stents in these days. Yeah, the, the, there's, a, there's a mechanics to the, to the human part of the human being that is beautiful and what we've been able to do to, to help it, to make it function, to address it, to cure it, to manage it, uh, is amazing in, in every way, shape and form. But it hasn't helped. It's not it. And it hasn't, de it hasn't develop, developed a society free of the ill conditions and the misbehaviours and the havoc that, that exists mm. from domestic violence to murder to rape, theft, etc., what it may be, mm. or even bullying in the workplace. Mm. So what we need to understand is that there is, a, uh, there is a being component, and that being, which makes up the other part of being human, is a multidimensional character that is sensual, that is um, energetic, that is uh, far-reaching, radiant, brilliant, and examining on many other levels than we can on a physical level measure. And so we need to understand that so that we can bring this multidimensionality to being human. And so if we can bring the two, we will have the perfect balance that is at present missing in society mm. and has historically done so. Mm. The Australian Bureau of Statistics has just announced that dementia is now the second leading cause of death in Australia after heart disease. What's the relationship between the anxiety and dementia, between conscious presence and dementia? How is it that people are getting to this state? How is it that this has become our most popular uh, killer, almost? If you understand the true meaning of, of the way in which I use beingness, everything is related. You can't have dementia void of anxiousness. Mm -hmm. You can't have dementia void of misery. You can't have dementia void of unhappy, uh, being unhappy. You can't, uh, you know, everything is interconnected. And what may, turn, what may start out as something very small and considered insignificant, it cannot be to something that is radiant, multidimensional and energetic. Mm -hmm. We need to address the smallest conditions, the smallest ills, the smallest mishaps we can at the being level and not just write them off simply because the human part can still continue to function even though there are a low-grade anxiousness or a low-grade misery or low-grade unhappiness in our bodies. That low-grade unhappiness, that low-grade misery is a compounding energetic effect on the human part that later makes the human um, 
not want to feel it anymore. It, the momentum has built so much so that the human element can no longer withstand the energetic impact that it's feeling inside itself. And so the human element seeks um, escape. It seeks to withdraw. It can't escape from the fact of what's happening inside its own body. And when we start to withdraw, we start to have ill mental health. Mm -hmm. Ill mental health it's very, very basic. It's, it's, the, it's the human being withdrawing and separating itself completely to the understandings that the beingness is bringing to it. And when we can start to address it this way, we'll have a very good understanding of what is truly going on psychologically for everybody. Mm. Because what I'm hearing you saying is we're living a lot less than who we are, than the potential, this multi-dimensional, this huge expression that that is naturally ours so many people are living life mundane and that is an illness like so the small things become later the ill conditions in the body but you're saying it's the small things that we have to look at the the detail that we have to address otherwise it accumulates and so for somebody getting through life in in their day to day what does that look like? What are those small things that we can actually make change now with? First and foremost, we need to understand that we're amazing beings. We are truly amazing. And when we can understand that, we have a different starting point from the point of view of health and what wellness means. means. And so mundaneness for, for an amazing person, for, an amaz for the amazingness that we are on an energetic level, mundaneness is already illness and disease. Mm -hmm. Being unhappy is already a dis-ease in the body. And we shrug that off, but at the amazing level that we truly are, it can't be shrugged off. It has an impact. It has an energetic impact. And we've got to address it at that level. So if we go back to what you're, where you're trying to take this conversation, is that we need to develop a way of being ourselves that is continuously self-fostering self-founding and, and self-developing into the beingness that we truly are. And we are to avoid at all costs anything that diminishes who we truly are. And so, no, the world may not be ready to have an education system that is developing our beingness. But the true teacher is within. We know who we truly are and we've got to develop the courage and the trust that we know ourselves better than anybody else and that we can start to develop those inner feelings and, and um, sensitivities that we have and start to communicate them first to ourselves and then with others and then slowly increase that out to society so that we can start to become very comfortable in expressing who we truly are. If we don't, we will live in the diminished um, result of that and it's in there that we start to seek the misery, the checking out and the numbing out with excessive food, drugs, t television, war games, computer screens, and we're missing out on the vivaciousness that is exuberant and living naturally within. Mm. When you mentioned all those different distractions, it, it, it struck me that there's so many different flavours that you can that you can have to check out from connecting to that amazingness, from that, the, that beingness, the, the escapism through television, through video games, through this, that and the other, um, drugs and alcohol. There's different extremes, but they serve the same purpose. And so, and so somebody's addiction might be, might be ice and might, might be very, um, you know, antisocial and 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 be considered into society to be an extreme. But what you're offering is that the television addict is is getting the same medication. They're getting the same result. Now, if the, if that's the case, why we have entire industries that are actually set up to keep us away from ourselves? And some of them are black market, and some of them are legitimate but they're all profiting off, off of that and we're feeding the beast because of the demand. So there's this, 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 
mutual dysfunction happening in industry and within ourselves. Question one, why is it that we are so unwilling to stop and go to the multidimensional being, which is so technicolor you wouldn't need a video game? Um, and what is it, you know, how is industry gonna, gonna shift from this dysfunction that it's in? First of all, let's break a myth here. The, the evil is not the supply. The evil is in the demand. Mm. We've got to understand that without the demand, there is no supply. And so, you know, the, the so-called uh, drug dealer cannot exist if there's no one asking for drugs. Mm. You know, if there's um, an excess uh, infiltration with um, television programs, we shouldn't be looking. Well, there's got to be viewers. Mm. And without viewers, without uh, the person asking for drugs, there is no you know, no, no sense in supply. So we've got to understand that the world is seeking escapism in any way, shape or form. And whether it be this or that, it's the human condition is telling us that there's something wrong about human life and that we're creating a demand for something as a result of something else that is not correct in us. And so we need to not point the p finger and make anybody out to be evil or anything like that. What we need to do is simply say, hey, there is something wrong at the root here. There is no other um, remedy other than to seek what everybody else has sought. And that hasn't worked either, but we haven't changed it. Mm. And what we've got to do is strip it back and take the hundred steps, you know, where, that we need to go in the opposite direction and just see in its rawness the fact that we have a society that is lacking in the development of the beingness that is the human being. And that is the bottom line. You have dropped a bomb here in saying that demand is the evil and that the focus shouldn't actually be on supply. You're actually knocking out a lot of activism and all the doingness that, that human beings go into to try to fix what's out there without the reflection back. At, at what's inside. And so we've kind of got it ass about face, don't we? Like, generally speaking, if we go to that, that demand and look at that first, then you couldn't have the angry activist. Activism would look very different. What would it look like? It would look like a march down the street chanting that we need to be much more responsible. What we need to do is uh, re-qualify the word evil here and say that it's the root of the evil of the problem. In other words, that, uh, that, that, the, that the root problem is in the demand, not in the supplier. And not that I was referring to evil as, you know, uh, as the connotation of the devil or Lucifer mm. or something like that necessarily. Yeah, we need to understand that we have uh, a very deeply rooted condition in the human in the human body in the human species and that's irresponsibility and irresponsibility i mean at the level of energetic responsibility we are living in a dynamic world and you can't just go off and do what you think is okay in the private of your own domain it has an impact on society this is where my books have have led and and have shown and and we have for the last 16 years since 1999 talked about the importance of energetic integrity and energetic responsibility, which is the highest form of integrity and responsibility in the sense that we have a contribution to the whole of the planet, no matter where we are. Mm. And this is an, isn't an fair, airy fairy stuff. This is fact. We are living in an ocean of energy. Now, we also have a level of energetic responsibility to our own beingness. And this is what the topic that you and I are discussing today in the sense that if we don't deal with our sensitivities, if we don't deal with how fragile we naturally are, if we don't deal with how tender we are naturally, that will cause us to have a misery, an angst, a tension that we will need to remedy. Mm. And the type of remedy that we seek is usually the, the, the chocolate, the excessive amount of chocolate, the excessive amount of coffee, the excessive amount of uh, any form of food to dull it out. And then we can get more extreme and go towards drugs. And then we can get television shows or we can bl uh, blow ourselves away with music or, or computer games. But 
All of that, as, I, as we said earlier, has its roots in demand, but the demand needs to be what needs to be examined, mm. and that is the fact that we are being irresponsible with who we truly are and not taking charge of who we truly are and bringing that out to the fore. It's very, very simple, mm. really. It just hasn't been practiced. What, what do you say to the Everything in moder Moderation Brigade? Because you could, you could argue that a little bit of chocolate, a little bit of wine, a little bit of taking the edge off is, is good for me to get back into a better state of being. And that's then good for me to be in a better state of being for my husband or my children. Or, or that, that relief is seen as a, a virtue. What, what do you, what's your view on everything in moderation? Everything in moderation is good for the human, but not for the human being. And so if we bring in the being factor, we understand a completely different form of anatomy and physiology because it's energetic based, it's multidimensional. If we just look at the human temporal physical factor, yeah, it can get away with, uh, with a night out drinking because the liver will do all the work for you and two days later you'll be back on your feet. But the beingness takes an impact in that. And when we put the two together because they're inescapable and inseparable um, as one, the human being, that's why we call the human being, we need to understand that there is a multidimensionality that we are not taking serious enough. And that's where we are being irresponsible. So for example, we can say that uh, a glass or two of wine is fine in moderation. But if we were to interview the liver and give it a voice, you know, if we stuck a microphone in the liver and said, what is your comment on that level of moderation? The liver will say, well, actually, I prefer if you didn't drink at all. Um, if you ask the lungs what they think about cigarette smoking, they will say, can you please stop doing that because you're killing me. Mm. And you know, we've, it's like we've a got punch a in the face to the lungs. Exactly. Like, like when is any amount of that okay? You exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, we, we, we've got to be a little bit uh, lighthearted about it, but at the same time deliver the seriousness of what is truly going on. Mm. And the best way to communicate this is the fact that there is a there is a functional version of being human, and there's also a multidimensional version of being a human being. And we cannot just say that we are one or the other. We are in fact a human being, mm. a multidimensional, interactive, amazing, gorgeous, spunky, adoring, cherishable, mm. loving, sensitive, very open, honest, humble, and extraordinary um, living species of, of, of a representation of life that needs to be nurtured in a way that we have yet to make society comprehend. Mm. Even though it is innately in us and we could very easily turn it over and make it our truth, mm. our reality. Mm. But when you talk to the human being that's in the human life and they just hear no drinking, no chocolate, like the, the, and, and responsibility all the time. Like this just, just feels like it's too hard. Like it, it's too hard. What do, we, what do we need to do to start to integrate this? When you start to realise that, that you have a huge responsibility in, in the way that you are, even what you think, in the way you hold your body, in all of these things, how do we not go into the overwhelm of what that means? In daily life. Yeah, look, I was uh, I was part of that myself. If you if you said that I couldn't have my dessert or my ice cream, my caramel sundae, my my glass of port every now and then, mm. or my Corona, um, I too would have freaked out. Mm. But if I take if I if we take that one hundred step back uh, rule and strip it all back, why were those things needed? Then you you start to have a completely different picture. Why did I need a substance that races me? Why do I need a substance that artificially stimulates me? Mm. Why do I need a substance that checks me out and makes me not, um, not truly sensitive, and, and etc. So if you only take five steps back, I'm gonna complain that you took away my corona. If you, if you ask me that why do I need my dessert, I'm going to challenge you because I need my rewards. I need my comfort food. 
But if you strip, strip it back 100 steps, you're going to ask me, why do you need a substance to bring you a reward when the greatest reward is being you? How could you possibly celebrate something greater outside of you and bring it into the body when that greatness is already living within you? And so that 100 step rule is a, is a beautiful approach to life because it gives us an ability to not have any ifs or buts or excuses because you stripped it all back and, and brought it back to the rawness and the beauty that is the human being, particularly the beingness of the human being. I'm going to put an if and button there, just, just to uh, play devil's advocate here. I had a re what if I had a really hard upbringing? My childhood was really, really difficult. My parents didn't love me or cherish me the way that they needed to. How am I going to look at life in this way? And I'm going to want, I'm going to want to medicate. I'm going to want to go to alcoholism or even excessive eating or whatever it may be. That is going to mask that hurt. You know, like there's, is there some responsibility we have to apportion to our parents? And when we do that, obviously it disempowers us. And there's a lot of people blaming their parents out there. So how do we start to kind of knock that out as an excuse? Look, you are very right and it's a serious uh, situation and we can't just be flippant about it. But we need to hear, we, we need here to talk about the energetic responsibility and the way in which true healing occurs. So if we stop at step number eight and say that's too difficult, I can't get over what my parents did to me then you are basically saying, I don't want to partake in this 100 step situation. What we need to do is go beyond and have a look at the fact that one, however horrible it was, we need to not judge and understand that our parents knew no different. And they too are the products of a reality that has been created absent of the beingness of the human being. So they too, no, no different, even though a lot of the time we try to allocate judgment by saying, you are the parent, I was a child, mm. you should have known better. But for, for a lot of people, they don't know any better. And if the child who is in judge, this is, this is a, an upside down turner as well. If a child is able to blame their parents for their misery, sorry, if an adult is able to blame their parents for their misery, then why is it that they haven't chosen behaviors that are good for them when they come un away from under the auspices and the parenting of their parents? Mm. In other words, what they're actually saying is their parents were a product of, that up of their up upbringing as they too are a product of a upbringing. So when does it stop? When did the generation stop this out of control momentum? What we need to do is say, right, it stops, starts with me. I've got to strip back everything. And I've got to come back and say, no, I wasn't parented to be in my beingness. No, I didn't get this at school, but I can start with me now, slowly. But surely I can strip away everything that is not my truth. And my greatest teacher is me. And I need to trust what I feel. I need to trust what I know. And to bring that to the fore, I can, in effect, reparent myself back into being who I truly am and therefore bring that character to society as a result of the broken character, as a result of the generational impact that human beings have had on parenting, schooling, upbringing and the education system. And that's where true generational change is possible. True generational change is not difficult, but if we... Uh, you know, if we draw the line and start blaming a certain generation, then we're missing the point. Mm. We've got to just go back a thousand steps in this mm. case and just strip it all back and say, hey, it started somewhere. It doesn't matter where it started. The fact is we started in, in, the, in the wrong way, in the wrong course. Mm. Your entire teachings are based on the principle of energetic responsibility, that there's no private world. We don't have a private world. And it occurred to me that even with the way we think and the way that we are with ourselves, the way that we speak to ourselves internally, that is a relationship that has an effect on everyone. So 
does a thought itself have an emanation? If I think an ill thought about myself, that's still an act activity that is being ill towards the being that is in the world that is going to have ramifications. Do, so I can't go around in a dark mood, for instance, and not expect that I'm not affecting other people. Is this what we're kind of talking about when we look at energetic responsibility? That we, to that detail, to that level of intimacy with ourselves, we need a responsibility? Look, I could go very, very deep with what you're touching on now. And, and uh, you know, the world of energy is known to me. It's known to us all. Uh, for me, it's very much in my conscious presence. So I understand it inside out and have a, a vocabulary that I can um, rely on and, and go to to describe it. But look, the easiest way to, to for our v listeners, viewers, is to basically say that we're living under an ocean and your every move your every uh, movement of, of your flipper, uh, of your dorsal fin, of your tail, has an impact on the water and how that will then move and affect other fish. And it, it's exactly that, you know, the, the squid that lives under a, a stone or a lobster that lives in its shell, whatever it is, it is that it's doing inside itself, it has a ripple effect in the ocean and that ripple effect affects everybody. And that's the most basic way of understanding human life. We, we are living in an energetic environment and you can't be miserable on your own. You can't be miserable in your room. Mm. It's going to be felt all over the world. Now, on a subtle level, yes, but nonetheless, it is contributing to the misery that is in the world. So in effect, you, you, we have this condition where we think we are very personal and private in, our, in what we do, but in effect, we don't understand that we have a responsibility to, un that, to everybody. And it's not like we can't be mis miserable if we are miserable. It's the fact that we need to look at why we are miserable so that we aren't miserable and contributing misery to everywhere. It's that level of energetic responsibility. It's not easy, mm. uh, but it's worthwhile if we all work together to, to get there. Mm. Beautiful.